Happy Friday! It is time to wear our Voorhees swag and be ready to learn. Uh, just some reminders. It is Friday, which means there's no more lunch. There's no lunch on Fridays at school. So if you're watching this Friday morning thinking, I'll watch this, I'll go get something to eat, not on Fridays. I hope you went yesterday because then you got double meals. Uh, also, I hope that you, and that also means if there's no lunches, there's no packets. So you're gonna have to wait till Monday if you have not gotten the new packet, get it on Monday. Also, um, I hope you're checking out Mr. Casayas' site this morning because it's Flag Salute Day. So, you know, we'll do our Voorhees song, we'll do our grit chant and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> also, you should be watching Mr. Casayas' videos as well. Remember his YouTube channel is Gritty Principal. He's got a number there for BCSD. If you have not picked up a Chromebook from school, uh, one of the advantages of having the Chromebook is that if you're having problems logging in to anything, it's already preset. You just go to it, you, you connect to your Wi-Fi at home, and then you're, it's just like you're back at school. Pluses and minuses, yes, it's easier to access like Google Classroom and some of those other things. Minuses, you don't necessarily get the YouTube, which means that's why I'm also putting our videos on Google Classroom. So again, you don't have to watch it on YouTube and Google Classroom, it's the same video. Uh, with that said, let's get ready for day four of Packet Life. All right, so here we are on day four of the packet. Uh, independent reading, 30 minutes. You know this. Uh, read the story. So there's a story in here. It's chapter four from a book. And then there's questions for the story. So we'll go over those. And then write the draft of your explanatory article. And then we have a task, procedures, challenge page, and fluency we'll work on in math. So let's get ready for this chapter. Story. Last hunger season, a year in an African farm community on the brink of change from chapter four, Wajala, the hunger. On the evening of April 5th, the rain returned with a vengeance. A bad storm rattled the Lugalu hills. Rain poured, hailstones pounded, and wind raged. The young maize stalks whipped back and forth in the storm. Uh, maize is basically corn. Early the next morning, after type milking to add the wait, after type milking to add the the a cow's note. I'm not sure what that's supposed to say. Leonida was in the field repairing the damage. She was on her hands and knees, forming little dirt mounds of support at the base of any stalks that were bent or leaning. She hadn't had anything to eat the day before, just tea, and now tea again for breakfast, and there would be nothing for lunch. The fieldwork was slow and draining, sapping whatever energy she carried from her breakfast cup of tea. In the early morning, she retreated from the sun and sat exhausted at the table of the living room. She stirred again when the girls returned from school, and together they fetched water and wood and lit the fire in the kitchen hut. As darkness approached, Leonida prepared the plain tea for her family. They were facing the second consecutive night of going to bed without food. Then Peter returned from his milk run. He was carrying a little packet of sugar and a bowl of ugali from relatives in some place. It was a good day, he noted. Tea with sugar, ugali, and sukama, like Christmas. During the hunger season, the fortunes of the farmers and their maize ran in opposite directions. As the maize grew taller and taller, stronger, the farmers grew weaker, both physically and financially. On April 7th, Gideon called Leon Leonida on her cell phone. It rang to the tune of Ris Rimsky Korsakov's piano masterpiece, Flight of the Bumblebee. Gideon needed 2,000 shillings to pay for extra instruction for math tests required to move up to the next class. Leonida had nothing of such value to sell except a young bull that had been born a month earlier to her black cow. It would be a couple of years before the bull would be much of an asset on the shamba, pulling a plow. Until then, it just consumed grass that the two dairy cows needed, and it didn't produce milk. So she sold it for 4,500 shillings. She spent 2,000 for the tutoring and another 1,000 for the math practice book, a ruler, and a calculator. She added some toothpaste and soap and a bit of sugar for Gideon. He needed to remain strong and successful. 
With the rest, Leonita bought a new school uniform for Jacqueline to replace her old ragged outfit. New school shoes for Sarah. All the kids needed to be suitable for school so they wouldn't be sent home. And then she brought she bought a goro goro of maize and some sugar for the family. Leonita had been hoping to keep the bull for a while, build up its value, and then sell it to raise money for high school tuition. But it was now what she need but it was now that she needed the money. So she sold from a position of weakness, just like she had with her maze the beginning of the year. It was a matter of necessity, not choice. In the one choice she did have, she again favored the future over the present, education over daily bread. The farmers had established a resiliency over the years to cope with the hunger season, to survive on diminishing portions and meals. They knew the Wanjala would end with the next harvest, but the poverty they hoped would end with education. The demands of the fields were unceasing. When they needed to plant the beans in between the maize stalks, they were complementary crops. The beans added some nutrients to the soil that the maize needed. The beans would also be ready to harvest before the maize, helping to bring the hunger season to a close. She also finished planting an early, more, early maturing varieties of maize on some strips of land beyond her half-acre plot of the one-acre maize. And she planted cassava. Then, too, there was the weeding, the constant task. Leonida often stated, started the field work at 8 a.m. after the pre-dawn household chores and fortified with only a wee cup of tea, worked through noon when the heat drove her into the shade. On April 14th, she began to top-dress her one-acre maize with nitrogen-based fertilizer. The one-acre farmers had been taught to whittle a sharp point to a stick and use that to poke a hole four inches deep into the ground next to every stalk. It took some exertion, leaning on the stick, pushing it into the rugged soil. Then they were instructed to measure out a tiny portion of fertilizer with a thimble-like scoop and bend deeply and add it to the hole. Push, bend, push, bend. Leonita repeated this for every stalk, hundreds of them. When they could, the Amua members helped each other, so Leonita repeated the wearying routine on other Shambas for the better part of a week. During the hunger season, the Shambas presented a giant paradox. While hunger mounted, the food ripened. There was plenty of food growing, but none of it would be ready to eat for several months. Leonita had maize, beans, cassava, potatoes, and sugarcane growing. Pumpkin vines were beginning to spread. Mangoes, avocados, and bananas were growing big on the trees but it wouldn't be ripe until late June or July. The farmers would just have to make it through. On the days without food, Leonita reminded her family, God is our leader. As the meager meal slowed Leonita's work in the field, she did the lack of nutrition slow the learning of her children. So did the lack of learning nutrition slow the learning of the children in school. The principal of the Luchao Primary School, who was in charge of 850 students, had sympathy for Dorcas and the orphan boys and the number of other children whose parents were struggling to provide enough food and allowed them to stay in school during the lunch break and have a meal, even though the parents didn't pay for half-day boarding. But Jacqueline and Sarah were still walking the two kilometers each direction, coming home for a lunch that on most days wasn't there and then going back on an empty stomach. Whenever they entered the school grounds, they saw the school's ambitions painted on big letters on the side of the administration building. Motto, hard work begat success. Mission, educate boys and girls to overcome challenges in their lives. Vision, to succeed by working hard. The Wandala mocked these goals. Both Jacqueline and Sarah complained to their mother that it was difficult to work hard in school on just a cup of tea. They were both good students with ambitious plans. Jacqueline hoped to be a nurse, Sarah, a teacher. They both wanted to go to high school, and Leonita clearly wanted that, too. It was a particularly important year for Jacqueline, who was in the eighth class and would be taking tests at the end of the year to qualify for high school. On the days they returned home for lunch and were told by their mother there was nothing to eat, they turned with a quiet fury and headed outside to sit in the shade of the avocado tree. Hunger didn't relieve them of their chores. They were up before dawn, getting out of bed in their kitchen hut, and starting the fire for tea. They washed dishes and tidied the yard. They began to trek to school before 6 a.m. After school, there were more chores to do, fetching water and firewood, 
helping with dinner if there was any, washing up afterwards. And there was homework around the kerosene lamp. Works seemed to be all the girls knew. They had never watched television or gone to a movie. Well, that's a happy story. Let's see what this says. All right. Question one. Why did Leonita sell her bull? Did she get as much as she could for it? How did she spend the money she received for it? Okay, that's directly in the book. Remember, there's one, two, three questions. So I'm looking for three answers over here. I want to know why, how much, uh, or did she get as much as she could, and what did she do with the money? How do farmers cope with wanjala or hunger? How do they hope to end their poverty? Again, there's two questions there. I expect two answers. Question three, what is the paradox presented by the Shambas or food gardens during the hunger season? That's the idea. This is one big question, but this question is deep. Basically, what's going on in April? When are the crops going to be ready to eat? That's the paradox they're talking about. Question four, which context clues help you determine the meaning of the word exertion as it's used in paragraph nine. Write your definition of exertion and indicate clues. So there's two parts to this as well. Go look for this word, look at the words around it, and put down, I think exertion means blah, blah, blah. I think this because. That's what they're looking for. All right, so then the back of this, they want you to write a draft for your explanatory article. Remember, you should have an introduction where you are talking about, um, let me grab our notes that we took yesterday. Um, where we're talking about the human impact and the, on the shortage of resources. Let's see what we've got here. Oh, what are the ways that human behavior affects the environment? Explain shortages of resources affects the overall structure of economy and society. So. You want to work the prompt into the intro. So you want some of this information to go into the prompt, but in your own words. Then I, you, we've talked, we had four resources. Talk about the polar bears. I don't know why I remember that one first. The coral seas. Talk about fire, talk about deforestation. And remember, and remember, you want to focus on the economic and societal impacts. How does it affect the money? And how does it affect the people? All right? So that's what that is. All right, let's take a look at the math. For each equation, explain whether it's true for all, true for some, or no values of A. Explain how you know. All right. It says, oh, basically what they want you to do, are ask, are these, um, you want, okay, let's just do this one together. If I break this apart, I get 3a plus 5a equals 5a plus 3a. Okay, so is this always true? If I put any number as a, if I put 9, is 3 times 9 plus 5 times 9 the same as 5 times 9 plus 3 times 9? If it's true for all, then you would say it's true for all. If it's true sometimes, then you got to say sometimes, or if it's not true at all, say no. This next one, 2 times a plus 1 is the same as 2 times a plus 3. Now, I don't know about you, but these don't look like, does that look like it's balanced? I don't think so. Let's put a number in. 2 times 4 plus 1 equals 2 times 4 plus 3. Because remember, a's have to be the same. So 8 plus 1 equals 8 plus 3. Are those really going to be equal? 
That's a big no. And the last one, 5a plus 3 equals 3a plus 5. Well, let's take the number 7. 5 times 7 plus 3 is the same as 3 times 7 plus 5. 35 plus 3 equals 21 plus 5. All you have to do is put any number in to see if it works. If it doesn't, then say so. But like I said, do yourself a favor. Don't use my examples. Throw your own number in. I just literally pulled numbers out and stuck them in to see if they would work. All right. So that's that. Combine like terms and expand terms. Oh, combine like terms. All right, well, I got an xy and an xy. So 10 plus 11 is 21 xy. And then I have an 11x and a 10x. So that gives me 21x. You're going to combine the same. So the next one, you have 5x plus 2x. Well, they both have an x. Just add the constants, okay? And that's what you're doing with this one. Don't forget when you get down to 7, you need to break that out. That's how you break it out. That's as low as it can go. You're just taking it out of that into that. All right. Oh, they've already given it to you. Okay. Use visuals to represent this ratio. Well, <coughs> draw a picture. Two, three, four. I have, for every five circles, I have seven squares. Something like that. Use a ratio table. Well, five, let's see, let's do it times two. Five, so we get 10. We get 14. We get 15. We get 21. You get what to do. Write a story. This is where you get to be creative. Maybe something in your pictures here can help with this. And for this one, well, think about it. 5 times what is 35? Take that same one and bring it to your 7. All right. And that's it for day 4. Your biggest task is going to be writing and going back over that story. Um, I realize it's Friday and we're on day 4. If you want to work on day 5 on the weekend, go right ahead. But I'm going to pick up with day five on Monday. So with that, happy learning and have a great weekend.